Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live at Calvary Church in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media or to tune into our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Now here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Take your Bibles, open them to Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49, when you get there, will be in verse 10. And I've entitled our Bible study, When God Says No. When God Says No. We all like it when God says go. I mean, it's a very exciting time. We've been praying, we've been desiring, we've been seeking and asking and knocking, and then the answer from heaven comes, and it's yes. All your desires, the answer is yes, go, move forward. When our prayers line up with God's will and we receive that encouraging yes answer, I mean, we celebrate it. It's exciting. We post it on social media. We tell everybody what God's doing in our lives. But what about when God says no? Well, when God says no, you don't see a lot of people posting that on the internet. You don't see a lot of social media about God said no and God shut this door and a lot of that. As a matter of fact, it's not really received the same way as a yes answer or a go answer from the Lord. We have a tendency to see associate yes with good and no with bad, but God uses them both in our lives to get us where he wants us to go. We often refer to that as his will for our lives. You could also refer to it as the destiny, his God-given destiny for you, where you're headed. And we know where we're headed, not just temporarily, but eternity. We're headed toward eternity. And God uses the yeses and nos of life to help us get there. Now, does God still speak to us today? Does he still lead his people today? Is God interested in what really happens to you? and me on a personal level? Does God have a master plan for our life? Those are important questions, and the answers to all of them is yes. Yes, God has a plan for your life. Yes, he's working things out, all working all things together for the good, for those that love him. Yes, he has a will and wants you to walk in it. The good news is, is that as believers, we are not victims of chance or of circumstance. We're not just hoping our luck won't run out or hopefully they'll have a lucky day. No, not at all. God wants to lead us and guide us and to answer our prayers. I asked you to open Isaiah chapter 49 because I love how the prophet speaking on behalf of God, how God uses Isaiah to give us this insight. And it's all over the scriptures, but I just really like combined with Psalm 25, how it's laid out for us here in Isaiah 49. Notice in verse 10, it says, they shall neither hunger nor thirst, Neither heat nor sun shall strike them, for he who has mercy on them will lead them. Even by the springs of water, he will guide them. And I'll make each of my mountains a road, and my highways shall be elevated. It's from a merciful, gracious, loving God that he leads us. And he leads us into very difficult situations. He leads us through very difficult situations. And we would do well to look to him, to trust him. Now, as you approach this Bible study and the no's in your life, it's important that you understand how God answers prayers. Now, someone along the way, someone once taught this, and I've adopted it as my own. I use it myself now, but I actually got it from someone. I don't remember who it was, but he gave a real easy way to remember how God answers prayers. So if you take notes, you should jot this down because it's very helpful in everyday life. And it's easy to remember. It's easy to remember how God answers prayers. And it's important to understand this and to grasp it and know it because when you don't, when you don't get what you want, you won't be easily stumbled. When your prayers are answered the opposite of what you expected, when your wants don't match up with what God says you need, you need to remember this because we're all praying and we all have requests and we all lay them before the Lord. You know, there's been so many times in my own life where I was certain something specific was God's will for my life only to find out very painfully that it wasn't. 
And that's a big letdown for sure. But God remains faithful. So here's a way to think of it when you're praying. Okay, you ready? Number one, if the request is wrong, then God says no. That makes sense. If the timing is wrong, then God says slow. But if you are wrong, and it is possible for you to be wrong, if you are wrong, then God says grow. So think about it. If the request is wrong, God says no, and that's his answer. If the timing is wrong, then God says slow, which we often refer to as wait, (laughs) and many are waiting today. But notice, do we ever take into account that if we're wrong, if our motives are wrong, our heart is wrong, then God's answer is no, you need to grow. Or what we might say, you need to grow up. This is a time of deep character building in receiving an answer that you didn't expect where God is developing our maturity and the depth of character, preparing us for what he has prepared for us. And God does that deep work. So if the request is wrong, God says, say with me, God says, no. If the timing is wrong, God says, slow. If if you are wrong, God says, grow. But if the request is right and the timing is right and you are right, God says, Go. Now, I did that yesterday too. Yes. Look, pastors like to rhyme, so you got to stick with the rhyming. No, slow, grow, and go. And it's an easy way to remember. God uses this all in our prayer lives. Some of you are going through one or two or three or all four of these even today. Why? So he might develop you, teach you to walk by faith. Today, we're reminded that God sometimes says, No, you have to be ready to hear that church. You need to be ready not only to hear that word from God, but to accept it, to accept it. You can fight it. You know, you can fight it. You can say, I don't like it. I don't want it. And you can fight it. But in reality, it came from God. So you're really not fighting maybe a person because sometimes, you know, decisions are made for us. Sometimes people in authority over us, situations happen and decisions are made that if we were making it, we might've made it differently. And so, you know, we get really mad at the people or we get really mad at the structure. We get really upset or frustrated, but really God is using that instrument in your life to give you the answer. So when you choose to fight against it, you're actually just fighting against God and you won't win. I won't win in that. We don't want to fight against God. Sometimes We'll refer to it this way, don't, don't we? we will, we'll talk about, you know, God has a will for your life and you can move forward. You can either go the easy way or the hard way, but you're going to go. And a lot of times we do choose the hard way. I think of, we're studying right now in our midweek study, the book of Exodus. We just started, just finished chapter two. We have this epic scene with Moses being chosen as the deliverer and he has in his heart, I think I want to serve God. I want to do it. And he takes things into his own hands when he sees an Egyptian beating up a Hebrew and he jumps in and he looks to the left and he looks to the right and he kills that Egyptian thinking he's doing God a service. He's doing, he's delivering, starting with this one Egyptian. The problem with Moses is, is that he didn't look up and receive his direction from God. And because of that, he did the right thing, wanting a heart to deliver the wrong way. And we just studied this. He's now on the backside of the desert for the next 40 years of his life. Or if you Bible students, you know, those 40 years represent a third of his life is going to be spent the hard way. He's going to learn a lot of lessons, not going to be wasted. But you eat on this side, we can choose not to take the hard way. You don't want to fight the closed doors of God. Now, we do use that. If you're new to the Bible or you're new to church, we use phrases. You might hear Christians use them and wonder what they mean. And when it comes to the will of God, when God's saying yes or no in our prayers, we use a couple of phrases that describe that. For example, when God says yes, you often hear us as Christians refer to that as God opened a door. That's an open door from the Lord. And what we mean by that is exactly what you would think. It's a great picture. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Just like every day, if you come to a door and it's open, what does it mean? You can go through. The door is open. You have complete access. Go through. If you come to a door and it's closed and you push on it a little bit and it's open, you can go through it. 
If you have a key, I think of the, all the doors here, uh, you know, all the doors, and if you're a leader here, a pastor, you carry a key, what that key is telling you is that even if you come to a closed door, you have access to open the door. So open doors mean go through them. On the other hand, when we refer to the nose of God or the stops of God, you know, the Bible says the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord, but so are the stops. You also often hear us refer to them as closed doors. That makes a lot of sense. If you come to a closed door and you kind of jiggle the, the handle and you pull on it and it doesn't open, the door is telling you, you can't come in. That's what a closed door is. There is no access. You, you need, I mean, you can try to kick through it. I mean, you could try to break in, but you are going against the message that the locked door is telling you. If you don't have a key and the door is locked, that closed door is telling you, you cannot go forward. So we use that language, open doors and closed doors. We like the open doors. We don't like the closed doors. And that's our problem because they're both equal in the hands of God to get you and me where he wants us. He opens a door so we can go forward. He closes a door to say, you don't go, you, it is not good for you. It is not for you. It may not be for you now. It may not be for you forever, but you can't press through, fight through closed doors. It's better to accept them. Now, the thought of God using difficult things in your life is hard for some of you, for many of you, if not all of us. Truly, if we could control things a little ourselves, like if we could lay out our lives and just kind of control it all, we would probably control every difficult thing out of our lives. That makes sense. Like if we were writing the script of our life as, as if it was a play, I mean, we would, we would just script out all of the pain and all of the difficulties. But that's not real life. Real life involves hard things, challenging things, difficult things. Real life in a fallen world, in a fallen body, with a battle against our flesh, hard things are gonna come. Sometimes those hard things come from God where he identifies the answer to our prayer is no. No daughter, no son. I have something better for you. And you know, you're fighting, it's like, no, 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 this is the best, this is the best, this is all I ever want. I live my, no, no, no. God says, I have something better for you. This is not good for you. And therefore he closes the door. Real life is that God is in control and we learn to yield to him through the good times, which I mean, seriously, when, when there's open doors and everything's going well, you don't have a problem with obedience. You don't have a problem with yielding. You don't have a problem with surrender because you like it. This is all you ever wanted. And so we find ourselves super happy and just throwing our hands up, singing really loud, telling everybody about it, posting it, you won't believe it. It's the things that we don't like that we don't receive from the Lord, that we fight. And even though you probably will never like it, through the difficulty, we need to learn to yield and surrender in the good times, but especially in the hard times, that God is at work, remaining open to the Holy Spirit. That word yield and surrender, even as we were singing today and we receive the instruction to raise our hands. You know, that's a place, that, that's a sign of worship, of course, but it's also a sign of surrender. When you put your hands up, you're very vulnerable. You're in a position where even you could be off balance or, but you're, you don't care. You're so caught up with the song. You're so caught up with life that you choose to raise your hands and surrender, yielding your life. I don't know how long it's going to take for you to realize that your control of your life is actually corrupting, you're ruining your life. You're making it harder for you. You're making it harder for the people that love you. You're making it harder for the people that are close to you, especially, especially when things are difficult and challenging. In Psalm 31, in verse three, it says, for you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Remember, it's for his namesake. It's his life. We can try to do our own thing and we can try to go our own way, but it's ultimately his will. It's ultimately his will that prevails. In Proverbs chapter 16 and verse nine, it says, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. 
Proverbs 16, verse 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but every decision is from the Lord. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. By the way, the book of Proverbs is all wisdom. These little wisdom nuggets that are scattered throughout Proverbs, all 31 chapters. Proverbs 19, verse 21. There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. I was thinking of another proverb. I don't know the address, but it popped into my mind. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. And we don't want the way that seems right to us. We want God's way. God's way involves very often I hesitate to use the word sometimes. I would substitute it very often. The will of God is discovered through a closed door and a no, just a straight up no from God. It's so important that we remain open to what the Spirit's doing in our lives, not resisting or trying to kick down or break through closed doors, receiving it as from the Lord. Now you're already in Isaiah. Would you turn over to chapter 55 here? I wanna share with you a very familiar passage in the Bible, but it is, I'm gonna give you some context on it so you understand what God is saying to us through the prophet, Isaiah 55. We're gonna start in verse one, and then I'll bring you to the place where it's most common, like how we mostly remember this section. Isaiah 55, verse one. He says, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you the sure mercies of David. Indeed, I've given him as a witness to the people, a leader, a commander for the people. Surely, verse five, you shall call a nation you do not know and nations who do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Then verse six, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he'll have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. And here, now verse eight, we, I often quote, here's the address. Let's hear. This is the context, seeking the Lord, searching him out, calling upon him. And then he says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. This is a beautiful picture of God's love and grace to us, letting us know that when we call upon him and when we seek him and it's a time of need or a desper- time of desperation or, or just even just in a general prayer life, we need to remember this foundational truth. God doesn't think like us. The pathway of discipleship and spiritual growth is not for you to change God's mind. That's impossible. The process that's happening in your life and mine is that he's changing our minds. We are being transformed by the renewing of our mind. We are being conformed into the image of Christ. It's one of the reasons why we place such a great emphasis on teaching every word of the Bible, because we know it'll change your life. As a matter of fact, uh, as it says in verse 11, notice, jump down to verse 11, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty but it shall accomplish what I please and I shall prosper it in the thing for which I sent it. Every time we open the Bible, God's gonna do something in your life. He has a purpose and a plan that he's developing in your life. Just as he has a purpose and a plan in the yes answers, in the no answers, and in the wait. God doesn't think like us. His ways and thoughts are so much different than mine. You know, there have been times when I'm worried. God's not worried. When I've been impatient, God's not impatient. When I've been upset, God's not been upset. Times when I wasn't too concerned, well, God was very concerned because his ways are different. Just when I think I have God's plan figured out, I learned that I don't. And God is teaching me how to walk by faith. As you walk through life facing open doors and closed doors, they are both used by God to lead us and guide us. Let me show you another example. Turn over to Acts chapter 16. 
We're gonna get there very soon here, but I wanna, I wanna show you here that even sometimes, sometimes God will say no to something very, very good. I mean, here's an example with Paul the Apostle. He's on a missionary journey. God's using him in incredible ways. Lives are being changed. You could say that God, Paul's desire here in Acts 16 is to preach the gospel. And then we would stand back and go, why would God ever say no to preaching the gospel? Well, pick up with me in verse six. Notice in chapter 16 and verse six. It says, now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Pause there for a second. If you like to write in your Bibles, right next to this verse, verse six, God said no. That's what's happening here. They want to go into a new region, this area of the province of, of Asia. They want to go and preach the gospel and God, the Holy Spirit, forbid them, stop them from going in. Verse seven, after they had come, and so they go a little bit to the, around uh, this area, they, they tried to get in a different way. Notice, after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Again, you like to write in your Bibles, this is the second time in a row that God said no. Now, this is shocking. This is shocking because all they want to do is help people. All they want to do is preach the gospel. All they want to do is do what God has called them to do. His whole life has been dedicated to this, but God said no. Now, he didn't say no to preaching the gospel. He said no to that particular area and that particular time. And Paul would do well to receive it. He wanted to go into that region, but faced a closed door. He wanted life's change, faced a closed doors, which in this moment, we often ask the question, why? That's a good question to ask, except that you're probably not going to get an immediate answer. Paul doesn't know. We know because we have the rest of the Bible. Paul, at this point, he doesn't know. All he knows is that he's forbidden. He was resistant. There was a resisting of God. Don't do it. Don't go there. And you know, Paul faced a lot of closed doors, not just the Holy Spirit forbidding. He was, he was stoned. He was beat up. He was shipwrecked. All closed doors on where he was headed. Some were temporary, some lasted a little bit longer, but Paul, his life has discovered all the good that came, all the wonderful things that came, all the outpouring in his life was filled with no's from God. It wasn't just a life of yes, because God had to guide him along the way. Paul doesn't know. He didn't know yet, but he was discovering the will of God by remaining faithful and trusting God in a very disappointing, hard and challenging season looking to him. I was thinking, you know, the church here in Aurora, this church was planted by God many years ago. Our birthday is in December of 1999. And I am here pastoring this church, have the privilege of serving you because of one of the worst, disappointing, discouraging seasons in my entire life. It was a closed door. Me and my family, just the, my wife and three kids and another family, we were ready to go to another city. And we were so close to going that we drove out on one of those times I had some extra time off at work with money in hand. We were ready to rent a, a house, move to that city. Uh, I'd already resigned from my job. They prayed over me at church already to send me off. And I was on my way. And the Holy Spirit forbid us from moving to that city. You go, Ed, how did that happen? Well, the Holy Spirit spoke very, very clearly. I understood every word the Spirit said. And let me just say, you might go, well, Ed, how does the Holy Spirit sound? Well, the Holy Spirit sounds a lot like Marie. <laughs> For me, at least. And we're driving in to that city in the wintertime, very brown and very uh, uh, hard on the eyes. And as we're driving into that city, this is how I remember it, so it's not an exact quote, but it's very close. I heard the Holy Spirit speak through my wife, Ed, there is no way in the world I'm gonna live here. <laughs> and what that did is it began a series of events. The jobs I had lined up didn't work. This thing over here didn't work. This meeting over here didn't work. These guys weren't who they, like I had all so many things lined up on that trip, but it was concluded at the end of that, those few days that we were not gonna move and that I wasn't gonna plant a church. It was a very hard drive going back 
Uh, it was a very, probably the, one of the first significant deep discouragements and depressions I've ever, I've only really had two seasons. That was one of them. The other one was with the loss of my son. So we're driving back, you know, and I, I got my job back because it was only a week since I resigned and that was not a problem. And, and uh, you know, there's a lot of battle going on because I had set my life on this. This is what I thought God wanted to do in my life. This is what I thought the will of God was. This is what I was praying for. Is this it? We've been praying for all these cities, all these places, and finally we found it, and then boom, a hard no. And you know, I'm grateful for some of the decisions I made. You know, one is I didn't get mad at my pastor. Like he, he was Lee praying for me and helping, but I didn't get mad. I needed to hear from him. Uh, another decision I made is I went back to our church because you know, I didn't want to. In the beginning, I didn't want to go back to our church because they'd already prayed over me and, and it was just a pride thing. It was just pride. You know why? Because I did not want to answer this question. Ed, what are you doing here? I didn't want to answer it. And I knew, you know, the church we came from, you know, six, 7,000 people. I was, I was serving in a high capacity, so I knew a lots of those people and everywhere I'd go, what are you doing here? What are you doing? Didn't we pray? And I would have to say, I didn't count them, but I answered that question. I went back. And I humbled myself before God. I went back, served uh, for about four to six weeks. You know, I was doing, and every turn, I'd turn the corner. Hey, Ed, what are you doing here? And this is the phrase that God wanted me to say 250 times, at least. I'm not planning a church. I'm not planning a church. I'm not planning a church. And that's exactly the work that God wanted to do in my heart. He was developing character so that I might be more effective in serving you. Now, I didn't know that. I didn't know that at all. At the end of four to six weeks, I came to the conclusion I'm never going to plant a church. I'll just stay in the corporate world. I did very well there. There was a bright future for me. Make a lot of money. Uh, give to the church. Serve in the church. But I would be fine. That, that would be a wonderful thing for me to use my gifts and talents in the corporate world and maybe serve in the church. That was great. It was settled. I was fine. It took about you know four to six weeks, just like I'm not planning a church. 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 Till finally, God finally said, "That's." I can work with that. And it just happened out of the blue. All of a sudden things turned. And through this event and that event and this event, I was given an opportunity to take a job with my company here in Aurora. And all of a sudden God enlivened that desire. Maybe God wants me to use me. Maybe he does. But I came here very different. And we're only talking months here. I was out there at the other city in January. I was here in July. I, like, I moved here, lived here, had an apartment here in July of that same year. But here's what God was doing. I didn't know it at the time, but I needed it revealed in me. And I can see it clearly now. The first city, very confident, you know, set. I think God can use me and I'm going to go and do a great work for God. And this is what God wanted me to understand. I don't need you, Ed, to do a great work for me. I don't need you. Oh, it's not like he demeaned me or doesn't want me. It's not like that at all. It's just the truth. He doesn't need me. He can do a lot of things without me. However, he wants to use me, just like you. He wants to use you, but he doesn't need us. It's his privilege. It's our privilege, his prerogative when it comes to serving. So by the time I come to Aurora, and God can do a quick work too. By the time I get to Aurora, it's a whole different attitude. I wasn't here. I didn't move here to do a great work for God. I moved here to be a part of the great work God was doing. And it doesn't sound too different, but it is night and day, <laughs> the work that God had to do in my life to get me to where he wanted me. He wanted me here. And he let me try over here. He let me try over here. He let me try. Let me pray. Let me dream. Let me think. But he wanted me here. And in order to get me here, it required a really hard closed door, one that cut to the core of who I was in relationship to me, but also to my God. Do I really, am I really open to be used by him? God uses these things in our lives and certainly used this in Paul's life. You know, here's our problem. I mean, we have many problems, but here's our problem when it comes to these things. We have a tendency to look at things in our lives in a small picture way, just really small, like what's up in front of us. What's the benefit? What's the consequence of this situation right now? What's it going to cost me? What am I going to have to do? And we're not thinking too far into the future as much as we are right now. Our questions are like, well, how does this affect me today? And I don't like this. This is uncomfortable and it's hard. And I don't know what I'm going to do today. 
Let me say those are natural and normal responses. Nothing wrong with it. If you didn't have a a response, I'd be concerned. These are natural and normal responses. However, as believers, we don't want to just live in the natural. We want to live in the supernatural. We don't want just want to go through life with our own wisdom, our own understanding. God has something so much better for us. We don't want to live on the natural. We want to take those natural responses and yield ourselves to the work that God wants to do in our lives. We don't want to just look at the physical because God is always looking at the spiritual. We don't want to just look at the here and now. We we want to also look at what God is doing in the bigger picture for all of eternity. There will be things that happen to you as a Christian. Hear me out. There are going to be things that happen to you as a Christian that will not make sense in the moment or in a week or in a month or in a year, perhaps even a lifetime. God may have a plan or purpose that will make a lot more sense when we know it, we just don't know it yet. And in the in-between, God is calling us to a life of faith, not sight. And this frustrates a lot of believers because you just live so sight, 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 sight. I just don't know what's going to happen. And certainly my trip to another city, I lived that out. It's like, what's going to happen in my life? I don't know. This is, this is the worst thing that could have ever happened to me. But it actually was the best thing. God was using it in my life to reveal things to me that I couldn't see on my own, that nobody could tell me, God, I had to be in such a position like you do to receive a word from God and have your own character revealed so that he might begin to work on it. In 2 Corinthians in chapter four and verse 17, it says, for our light affliction, that's the temporary, that's our problem, which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That's the eternal. So everything in our life is working for us, not against us. And while it has a temporary uh, situation consequence, it has an eternal benefit, far more than what you're going through right now. But it says, while we don't look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal very similar to what we studied last time to fix our eyes on Jesus. Now, over the years here at Calvary, we've had to make decisions that have been glorious and wonderful. They've been great open doors because they're fresh. You know, we celebrated them. We clapped them. Yes, this is new. This is fresh. Upward and onward. Let's go, church. However, we've also had to make decisions here at Calvary that are glorious and wonderful and worth celebration, but they don't seem that way because they're painful closed doors. Recently, we've had to make the decision here at Calvary to allow this season of the Calvary Christian Academy to come to an end. After this semester, it's clear from the Lord that we need to let this season go. Very hard. It's been many years in the making, praying and asking God for wisdom, and this is the time. You know, it reminded me, we've seen a lot of closed doors with the school through the years. I remember the first time we had a really significant issue with the school where we had to let the pre-K go. So many kids, but because of regulatory things and the configuration of the building, we just couldn't do it. And a lot of other reasons, but we couldn't do it and we had to let pre-K go. Then along the way, I had this big vision as a pastor just coming from California, the church I came from, that we would have a high school on this side of town that we would be able to provide a high school and we'd play in sports and it would be amazing. And I remember the year God said, just let it go, Ed, it's not gonna happen. I'm like, what do you mean it's not gonna happen? We haven't even tested it yet. The Lord says, you gotta let it go. So we let it go. Then last year, we had to make the hard decision with the school to let the junior high go, the middle school go, which was very, very painful and hard, but it was a compromise because even the reality of the school not lasting through the middle school, letting the middle school go to see if we could save the school, that was the compromise we made. And it's just not possible. And now at the end of this semester, we have to let it go. We have a renewed focus we've had for quite some time though in our church. Our church has a renewed and refreshed focus that we're taking toward the kids in our church, uh, changes in our investments and changes in our children's ministry, in our youth ministries, junior high, middle school, high school, and even a revamping of our young adults to help them launch off and be the adults that God has called them to be. 
God is calling us as a church to more focus more deeply on Christian discipleship, both of the parents and the grandparents, but also of the kids. And one of the scriptures the Lord gave us during this time of obedience is in Ecclesiastes chapter three and verse one. It says, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. And it's important that we learn to receive from God the open doors as well as the closed. Now we have been discipled well, I believe, in our church family. Uh, We've been discipled well as servants and as leaders, even as you had the school of ministry up here, I think they've been discipled well. Pastor Chuck Smith taught us on this, handed down to my pastor and then handed down to me. And I have the privilege of now sharing with you that we've been taught and discipled to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and to obey him at all costs that you would rather have the consequences of obedience than the consequences of disobedience every time. It's very important for us as believers, but also as leaders. It's part of taking steps of faith or what Pastor Chuck used to call, who's now gone home to be with the Lord, he he called them ventures of faith. And I wanna read a quote to you here. If you uh, you want a copy of it, just email me and I'll send it to you. Um, Also the previous things on prayer, I can send those to you as well. But here's what Pastor Chuck says, and I quote, It's always an exciting thing to give God a chance to work. God wants you to be a part of what he's doing. God doesn't want to stop working, so it's important for us to discover what he wants to do. I found that the way we discover how God wants to work is to venture out in faith. We need to step out and see what the Lord might do. But as we step out in faith, there has to be a guard against presumption. A lot of people who test the waters to see what God might want to do make a serious mistake by falling back on human effort when God's hand obviously is not in it. Sometimes we can get so committed to something that our reputation seems to be on the line. Then we start pumping extra energy and effort into a program that wasn't of God to begin with. I ventured out many times only to discover that God wasn't in it. What do we do then? You retreat. What gets us into trouble is when we proudly say, we're gonna make this thing succeed. We find ourselves spending all of our energy trying to create something that God isn't a part of, and it can just rip you up. When I step out in faith, if it succeeds, I rejoice and say, great, the Lord led me. If it doesn't succeed, I step back and say, I thought it was a good idea, but it sure fell on its nose. So I think there are certain precautions that one must take in any venture of faith. Paul would put it this way in Galatians. Are we going to try to perfect in the flesh what God started in the spirit? And the answer is no, we can't in any area of our life. Now looking to the future, I wish that we could, I could tell you what the future is. I mean, I wish I knew you would come and ask me, what's God doing? What's he going to do? I don't know yet. Because the will of God is discovered. That's how you know the will of God. You discover it. The will of God is discovered and revealed. It's not planned, scheduled, and dictated. Now, you can live your life like that and kind of dictate, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. But that may or may may not be the will of God. The will of God is discovered. The will of God is not a task list of things you're supposed to do and people you're supposed to see, and things we all line up, and we're going to press in and fight. No, God doesn't want you to fight his will. He wants you to discover it. He wants you to receive it. As you live your life abiding in Christ with an open heart and an open mind, you'll learn what God has for you in this situation. So church, the will of God is good. The will of God is good as hard as it sometimes is. The will of God is good for us, as hard as it sometimes is. We have to settle this in our minds. God desires obedience more than he desires sacrifice. To learn how to obey what God is revealing, not to press through closed doors, not to be upset, taking all of our cares and concerns to the Lord. I mean, there is, you know, when you think of some things, it hurts and it's difficult and we wonder what the future is but we're learning how to trust in the Lord. You're gonna be able to look back on these things that you're facing right now. And you're gonna be able to see what God was doing. You can't see it now. It's hard to see right now. You don't have the big picture. You're not high enough to see the beginning and the end. But God knows his things are working for us. 
And who knows where he's moving and leading and guiding you. Somewhere along the way, we've got this view of God that he's just wanting to hurt you and ruin your life. It's not true. You're sitting there hurting. I can't believe what is God doing in my life? He's developing you. He's strengthening you. He's pouring himself into you. I mean, you, you think about how much this situation's drawn your attention to the Lord. I was thinking, you know, parents, you understand this. You understand this, grandparents too. That when, let's say you took your kids to the park and or somebody took them to the park and they came home and they go, you know, mom, you won't believe it, dad. You can't believe it. This guy bullied me at the park. I just can't believe it. I've never been bullied before and he beat me up. Now, the last thing as a parent you want to do is like, okay, son, let's go down and we're going to beat him up. That wouldn't be good discipleship. It might be what you're feeling, but you shouldn't be feeling about beating other kids up, all right? But you're wanting to protect your kids, right? It's your natural response. It's not supernatural, but it's natural. And those natural responses need to be submitted to the Lord. The proper thing to do is to talk to your child, teach them about it. If there needs to be a trip down to the park to talk to parents or anything, you do that in an organized civil way to talk about what's going on with what happened with your child. But it's not to take things into your own hands. But you know really why God allowed that? Why did God allow that with your son or daughter to be bullied? To get them closer to you. They came running to you. They came crying to you. They came listening to you. They came trusting to you. And I find often in the closed doors, the best place to run is to the Lord. So that he can disciple you and direct you and help you of what the future might. We don't know who, what, what the future holds, but we do know who holds the future. We can follow him confidently. And as soon as you yield and surrender, God gives you a new peace that passes all understanding. And you, you know, we, the problem is, is we think we're going to live on that peace forever. Right? We're just going to live on it. Like, oh, I had a peace yesterday. Now I'm going to take me in the next year. No, it's a fresh new thing every day. It's new. Every morning is mercies. God does want to reveal his will to you daily, moment by moment. He wants to use you in greater ways. And there's no secret formula to follow. There's no uh, miraculous methods to adopt. There is just a simple man and a simple woman immersed in the word of God, reading their Bible, praying every day, saturated by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, asking, seeking, and knocking, listening, and responding in obedience, no matter the cost. Because obedience will cost you. It will cost you something. It'll be painful. It'll be hard. It'll take you from glory to glory. Obedience is going to cost you. But let me just mark my words, okay? Listen, mark my words. Obedience is going to cost you, but disobedience will cost you more. Every single time. So we want to face these things with an obedient, yielded heart to the Lord. Let me close in two places. Turn over to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. I like this section uh, we're almost familiar. We're almost always familiar with Matthew's version of this, but I want to give you Luke's version. Uh, it just says a fresh approach to this teaching of Jesus in parallel in Matthew chapter six. But here in Luke 12, draw your attention to verse 22, where Jesus is speaking to the disciples then, just like he's speaking to us now. Therefore, I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or about the body, what you'll put on. Life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Just mark that phrase, life is more. You can add anything after it, but life is more than this temporary setback or challenge. Consider verse 24, the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, but God feeds them. How much more value are you than birds? And which of you worrying can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? And that's our issue at times, isn't it? O oh, you of little faith. I don't think he's being upset. He's just like, this is an area. This is the area of strength, trusting him. Notice, he says, <clears throat> as he continues on this teaching in verse 29, do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. 
For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your father knows, that's another phrase, your father knows what you need. He knows you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. And verse 32 is why I chose this. This is so beautiful. You think God's holding out on you right now. You think God's saying no. You think it's so hard. And all of those, you know, the the feelings and emotions are real. You just got to remember feelings and emotions, they're real, but they don't always tell us the truth. (laughs) You're hurting and it's hard. But here, here, God is not holding out on you. Notice verse 32. Do not fear, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This is God's heart. He wants to give you his best. And the difficulties we're facing now is all part of the process. Open and closed doors. So what do we do when God says no? Come back to Psalm 25 with me. I think there's a practical insight of exactly how we're to respond. What will help us in those early days of difficulty? What do we do when God says no? Psalm 25 in verse four We turn to him and then notice, we come to him with this prayer. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. And as you come with that prayer, you respond with yielding, surrender, and obedience. Sometimes God says no. Sometimes God says slow. Sometimes God says grow. And sometimes God says go. Each of those answers to prayer are from a God that loves you and wants to give you the kingdom. Keep your eyes on him, church. He'll get you through this. And you get through this, whatever it may be, whatever this might be in your life, he'll get you through this and he'll strengthen you for what's up ahead. Why? He's preparing you for what he has prepared for you. Amen? So Lord, thank you for your word today as it speaks to us and just knowing that the hardships and the challenges we face, they are. They're hard, they're challenging, they create fear in us, fear of the future, fear all the way around, Lord. But I'm encouraged today that your desire for me is that you wanna give me the kingdom. You love me, you care for me, you care for us as a church. And we're gonna get through this, whatever this might be. You're gonna show yourself faithful. Lord, help us, because we can make things so much harder. We can choose to go the hard way. But God, our desire is to choose the right way. Not to make things more hard for ourselves, but to yield and submit ourselves to what you've allowed in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Church. For prayer, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. To listen to this message in its entirety or to join us for our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.